Simon Jones here from hitfilm.com. Last year we showed you how to do the energy beams for a classic Harry Potter magic effect. And now, finally, we can show you the final piece of the puzzle, which is how to create the spewing particles that hit the floor. If you've been trying to figure out how to use the particle simulator in HitFilm Ultimate, this tutorial is going to be really useful, so I'm going to go through a lot of common techniques. One thing I'm not going to be talking about is the energy beams, so check out the other tutorial from last year for more info on those. There's a project file you can download so that you can easily follow along with this tutorial. Just follow the link on the screen to grab it. You can also find it in the YouTube description and on the HitFilm blog. OK, open up that project file in HitFilm Ultimate. You'll find a couple of composite shots already set up. In the completed shot comp, you'll see the finished effect so that you know what we're aiming for. The other comp is called tutorial starting point and that, surprisingly enough, is where we're going to start. The black background plane, in case you hadn't guessed, is there to give us a solid black background to the shot, rather than a transparent one. It can be pretty much ignored, although you want to make sure it stays as the bottom layer. If we open up the other layer, you'll see it already has a few effects applied and ready to go. The central flare you can see in the viewer, but the two beam effects are currently invisible. If I double click the blue beam so that it shows up in the controls panel, you can see that they're based on the lightning effect. By opening up the start and end groups, you can see the start and end position properties are both set to zero, which is the center of the frame. And indeed, you can see the handles on the viewer, which can be dragged around. We're not going to position them that way though, so I'll just hit Ctrl Z to undo those changes. Now I'll add a point layer from the new layer menu. This I'll rename by hitting F2. Point layers default to 2D, so I'll click on the blue square on the timeline and switch it to 3D. This will also add a camera automatically. This point I'm going to move off to the right by dragging on the red arrow. If I go back into the blue beam effect now, I can assign the start point to use this point layer. I'll add another point now, switch it to 3D and name it Impact. This point will be used multiple times, but I'll start off by linking the blue beam's endpoint to it. Because the impact point is also positioned in the center of the viewer, nothing would change visually, but you can see that if I move the point around, the blue beam follows it. I'll just undo that again. OK, I'm now going to select the blue beam source layer and duplicate it by pressing Ctrl and D. This I'll rename red beam source. You can probably see where I'm going with this. I'll move the red beam source layer over to the left, then go into the red beam effect and link up its start and end points in the same way as before. I'll also now go into the central flare effect, open up its hotspot position settings and attach it to the impact point. We could have just positioned all those elements individually, right? True, but here's the benefit of using point layers to drive it all. If I now select the impact layer and move it around, you can see that all the effect elements are locked onto it. From now on, I only need to animate a single layer to move all three effects. What's really interesting is that we're using 3D points to drive what are 2D effects. So even though the light flare and lightning effects are entirely 2D, we can orbit our camera around and get the illusion of proper 3D. Pretty nifty. Right, it's now time to dive into using particles. Here from Ultimate's Particle Simulator is probably its most powerful and exciting feature, but that also means it's one of the more complicated things to wrap your head around. We know a lot of you are really keen to get a better understanding of how it all works, so hopefully this will help. In the effects panel, twirl open the 3D group and drag the particle simulator onto the timeline. It's important to put this layer below the energy beams layer for reasons which will become clear later on. So, there are our default particles. I suspect this is the point where people feel a little intimidated by the particle simulator, as you're suddenly faced with a million choices and options, and you don't quite know where to start. Well, despite doing some cool stuff, this particle effect is actually surprisingly simple to create. Particle simulators have a specific construction. Inside any particle simulator layer can be multiple emitters. Now emitters are the things that actually spawn the individual particles. Then each emitter can contain multiple particle systems. A particle system defines what actually pops out of the emitter. Therefore, you can have different types of particles come out of the same emitter, as Axel explained really well in his time tunnel tutorial last time. 
For this tutorial, we are keeping things simple and only using a single emitter with a single particle system. First up, let's use that impact point again for the emitter. So in its shape settings, attach it to the impact layer. You can see now that if we move the impact point around, everything is nicely latched on. Setting up your emitter's trajectory is really important as this determines how the particles are spawned and where they first start moving. Currently we're using random, which means particles can emerge going in any direction. We want a bit more control than that, so I'm going to change this to cone. As you'd expect, cone emitters spew particles out in a particular direction. We don't want them all spitting out to the right though. To make things far more interesting if the cone direction changes throughout the shot. The simplest way to do this is on frame 0, turn on keyframing for all the trajectory rotation properties, then press the end key to jump to the end of the timeline and increase the rotation values. I'll go for quite high values so that the cone spins around lots of times during the shot. You can see now that the particles are going out in varying directions, as if somebody is waving a garden hose around. Once they're created though, the particles aren't doing anything particularly interesting. So let's move on to the particle system itself. Particle system properties can be a challenge to understand because they all have the capability of drastically changing particle behavior. Let's take a look at one group at a time, starting with the movement group. The particles are clearly moving far too slowly. We need them to fire out of the emitter really fast. As you increase the speed property, note that the particles move further out. So even though your playhead is staying exactly where it is, you can tell that in the same amount of time, the particles are going further due to their faster speed. I'm going to go for a speed of about 500. Our particles are still a bit large though. Let's make them quite a bit smaller. Going down to about 25% looks about the right size. The problem though is that we don't want them to all be the exact same size. That's where the variation settings come in. So for each movement property, you can find an equivalent movement variation property in the group below. Variation adds a random factor to your properties. So if I set the scale to 15% and the scale variation to 10%, it means that the scale of a newly birthed particle can be anything between 5% and 25%. Setting variation for your properties can help to make particle effects look more natural and less perfectly computer generated. There's obviously lots more customization that can be done, but the next thing we want to work on is the physics of the scene. Without that in place, it's hard to see what the shots will actually look like. First up then, let's add some gravity. This is done using something called forces. Playing with forces is really good fun, so do take the time at some point to explore the different types and options. The forces group is found right down the bottom of the particle controls. A new force can be added at any time by clicking on the blue icon. Handily, the default settings are designed to provide a gravity type force. If you play through the timeline, you can see the force pulling all the particles straight down. Looking more closely, you can see that the rotation of the cone emitter is still having an effect, with some particles moving off in their initial directions before being dragged down by the force. We now need something for the particles to hit. This is done using deflectors, which are surfaces that particles can collide with. Deflectors are added in the same way as forces by clicking the plus icon next to the deflectors group. The default deflector is a cuboid shape. To actually see it in the viewer, expand the deflector and select the shape group. This will show a red 3D outline. Currently it is sitting right on top of the particles, which means nothing is happening because none of them are hitting the outer edge. If you move the cuboid down until it is below the particles, you can then start to see them impacting upon the top. We're actually not going to use the cuboid for this example. Instead, add a new plane layer called Floor, switch it to 3D, and then rotate it on the x-axis by 90 degrees so that it's flat and can serve as a floor. In the deflector settings, I'll now switch the shape type to Layer and link it to that floor layer. I can now move that floor plane around in the scene as my deflector. You'll note that the layering looks a bit odd here. That's because I have a 2D layer between the floor and the particle layers, which breaks them into two separate 3D spaces. This can be useful in some cases, but for now I'll just move the plane layer down so that it's next to the particle layer and in the same 3D space. Okay, we now have gravity pulling the particles down and a floor deflector for them to hit. 
but the particles are disappearing a bit too quickly, as I want them to linger on the ground for a while. If we look back in the movement group, you can see why. The life property is set to just one second. Let's boost that up so that each particle lasts a good amount of time, let's say about seven seconds. You can now see that some of the particles are falling off the edge of the floor. To fix that, we can go back to the deflector settings and turn on infinite plane. This means that the particle simulation will ignore the actual size and shape of the plane and extend it out along all four sides. This is a useful shortcut for having a large floor without needing to make a giant plane. We can actually turn off the visibility of our plane now because we don't need it for this particular example. You can see that even with the floor layer turned off, the simulation is still able to use it as a deflector. It makes sense now to take a look at the bounce and friction settings. These do pretty much what you might expect. Try turning up the bounce to the maximum and you'll see an immediate impact on the particles. Scrub through the timeline to see it in motion. Now try dropping the bounce down to 0% to compare the difference. Next up compare friction at 100% and 0%. On full, you can see the particles come to a complete stop as soon as they hit the floor. If you drop it down to 0, the particles keep on moving, unaffected by the floor. Just by adjusting these settings you can probably already think of a load of different uses for the particles. For this Harry Potter effect, the defaults of 50% seem to actually work about right. One problem though is that it's all a bit too uniform. You can see that the particles start to form a ring shape after a while. This is because they're all being subjected to the exact same bounce and friction settings. Back in the movement variation group, if we add a variation of 25% to each, we get a much more interesting slightly randomised result. The particles now feel more real because they're each behaving ever so slightly differently. It all looks a bit sparse currently. If you go to the particle systems general group, you'll see that 50 particles are being created every second. Adjusting this setting will of course change the density of the simulation. Drop it down to 10 and there'll hardly be any particles. Rack it up to 500 and it looks loads better. You can add more particles if you want, but bear in mind that the more particles there are, the longer it will take to render. But if you've got a chunky GPU, feel free to really go for it. There's one more tweak we can do to make the overall animation more interesting. Remember how we applied the rotation to the emitter trajectory cone earlier? Well, let's now do the same thing to the impact point. So, activate keyframing for all rotation properties on frame 0, then go to the end of the timeline and increase that rotation. The rotation of the impact point now adds to the rotation of the emitter, creating even more random movement. But let's take it a step further. The rotation of a layer uses the anchor point as its axis. So currently the anchor point is set to 0, 0, 0, which is right on top of the point itself. But let's change the Y anchor position a bit. You can see all the effects that are linked to the impact point now being offset from the gizmo in the viewer. You can do this as much as you want. Where it gets interesting is when you then scrub through, rather than the point rotating on the spot, it's now orbiting around that shifted anchor point. The result is even more random movement of the particle emitter and also some 3D movement of the light flare and the ends of the red and blue beams. This creates a much more exciting dynamic effect. Once you combine this with our other tutorial and track the beams onto your actor's wands, you can imagine how cool it will look much better than the impact just sitting in the same place the whole time. We're now going to grade our particles a bit to make them look more interesting and globular. Globular is a good word. So, let's add a new grade layer. As you probably know, these are used for adding effects to all the layers underneath them. In this case, we therefore want to move the grade layer to be below the energy beams and the light flare layer, but above the particle layer. This will enable us to grade the particles without affecting anything else. There's actually quite a few ways to achieve a glowy appearance in HitFilm using different combinations of effects. In the completed shot comp, you can see two completely different examples. Make sure you only turn one on at a time. So here's a glow that is achieved using a couple of actual glow effects. And here's a version that uses the diffuse and exposure effects for a slightly different look. Which one you go for is entirely up to you, but I'm going to take a closer look at the first method. So. Back in the tutorial comp, I'll add a glow effect to the grade layer. The threshold property determines how bright parts of the image need to be before they start glowing, so I'll drop that right down to zero as we want everything to be affected. I'm then going to ramp up the intensity so that I can see what's happening, 
then drop the radius down until I have a glow that is quite tight and defined on the particles. I'll then drop the intensity back down again to something less drastic. Now I can duplicate the glow effect, again with Ctrl D on the keyboard, and adjust the settings of the duplicate to have a much larger radius but a lower intensity. The combination of these two glow effects creates a nice look. You can actually carry on with this technique for as long as you want, adding a third glow with a larger radius and a lower intensity. Each glow builds on the previous one to create the final look. To get the vibrant colour, let's add a colour wheels effect and tweak the highlights, midtones and shadows until we get something that looks cool. You can go for whatever colours you want here of course. You've probably noticed that when the particles disappear at the end of their life, they simply pop out of existence. It would be less distracting and far more natural if they faded out slowly. To do this we use the lifetime controls. So, first select the particle system in the controls panel, then take a look at the lifetime panel. This panel is something you might not have spotted yet, but it's really important because it gives you extra control over your particles. Whereas all the properties in the controls panel affect either newly created particles or the entire particle system, the lifetime controls instead apply to individual lifetimes of each particle. So if we switch to the alpha lifetime property, you can see there's a grey bar. From left to right, this represents the 7 seconds of lifetime of each particle. If we switch it onto gradient mode, we can then add new tabs to the bar by clicking just underneath it. Let's add a new tab and set it up so that the particle becomes transparent at the end of its life. The last step is to turn on motion blur for the particle simulation layer, which makes the fast movement look far more natural. If you want, you can also add a camera spin like we did in our example. This is really simple and uses the same techniques we've used throughout the tutorial. So I'll add a new point layer, activate Y rotation keyframing, and set it to rotate twice during the scene. I can then parent the camera to the point, and instantly we have a smoothly orbiting camera. Hopefully you'll now have a pretty good idea of how to use deflectors and forces with the particle simulator. That was a pretty long tutorial, so congratulations and thanks if you managed to sit all the way through it. We've got a never-ending list of tutorials in the pipeline, but if there's a specific topic you guys want us to cover, make sure you let us know. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.